Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention? If you're all seated, we can get straight into the lecture by Dr. Shahid Javed Burki. I'm sure you've all seen the announcement of the lecture, so I'm not going to take either your time or his time uh, introducing him, but I need to say a couple of things more on a, on a personal note. Um, I've read Dr. Burki for many, many years. Uh, he used to be a, he continues to be a regular columnist, but he used to be a regular columnist in the 1990s. But the first time um, I had to read him as part of my job was when I was working for the Prime Minister of India. And one day, the Prime Minister called me in and said, there's a friend of mine called Shahid Javed Burki, and he's writing a regular column in the dawn. And I want you to get me every single column of his and keep track of whatever he writes and make sure that I read it. And so for more than a year, he wrote a series of articles what, 10 of them, a series of articles on Pakistan, on the Pakistan economy, and on, on South Asia as a, in general. And so as a part of my job, I was required to keep track of his writing. And I must confess, I was immensely impressed by the range and depth of his scholarship, and more so by the courage of his ideas which I think have gone a long way in shaping thinking within South Asia and in shaping perceptions about uh, Pakistan in the world as a whole. But today, Dr. Burki has come to speak to us on a subject that he's been engaged with in the last few years. I must also add another personal note that I had the pleasure of working with him. We were colleagues uh, for a few months at the Institute of South Asian Studies in Singapore, where, where he was a, where he continues to be a visiting fellow, and I, I spent a year as a visiting fellow. And during that period, um, Dr. Burki started looking at Asia as a whole. Has written extensively on the impact of China on on Asia um, and on the global economy. And more recently, he's been looking at what's happening in the Arab world. And therefore, I think. Very appropriately, um, we chose the subject, Arab, the Arab world's place in a changing global economy. Dr. Burki is a Rhodes Scholar. He was at uh, Cambridge and um, at Harvard. He has been um, a civil servant in Pakistan for many years, a minister for finance, and then for several years uh, worked in the World Bank uh, rising up to the level of the Vice President of the World Bank. Today, he lives in the United States. He works out of Singapore. He flies into Pakistan to advise the President. And therefore, we are delighted that he's found time to spend uh, this weekend here uh, in Bahrain, speaking to a very distinguished audience, Dr. Burki, uh, who have come for the second time um, this, this, this month, in the, in the course of the last month, uh, for a discussion on the global economy. We had a lecture here by Charles Robertson on the impact of what's happening in Europe on the world economy. And therefore, we are delighted that we can hear you on what you see as the impact of what's happening in the global economy on the Arab world. Dr. Wilkie. Well, Sanjay, with this kind of uh, introduction, I am bound to disappoint your audience. Uh, <clears throat> but I'll do my best not to disappoint. Uh, when he sent me an email and suggested that I visit uh, Bahrain and talk about this subject, I jumped at the opportunity because uh, I find what's happening in the Arab world, what's happening in the Middle East, is of enormous consequence, not only for the countries where these changes are occurring, but for the rest of the world. 
The main message I want to leave with you, by the way, I have a written note, which I will not particularly use for this presentation, but you know, Sanjay has told me that he will circulate it in some form or, or the other. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is based on what I have written in the note. The main message that I want to leave with you uh, this afternoon is that there is enormous change taking place, not just in the Arab world, but in many other parts of the world. Uh, those changes are familiar to you. Uh, there is uh, obviously uh, the Arab awakening, which began uh, about 13 months ago with the self-immolation self of a fruit vendor in a small town in Tunisia and has now resulted in uh, the change of a number of regimes and is threatening several others. So that, that's one aspect of change. There is also enormous change afoot in Europe. Uh, Europe is struggling with its identity. It is also struggling with uh, some, finding some kind of a solution that would pre preserve the union and maintain the common currency uh, that they put in place. Uh, my own view on Europe is that they made a mistake in combining politics with economics. Initially, uh, the European Union, when it was composed of about a dozen countries, was a viable economic union. But then confidence and political ambition came in the way, and they expanded south to include the Mediterranean nations so that they would become permanently democratic, and they expanded east in order to bring in the countries that were once part of the Soviet Union so that they would no longer be subject to Soviet or Russian control. So marrying economics and politics within one structure uh, has been a difficult enterprise, and that is uh, what's happening in, uh, in, in Europe, an important part of the world. The third area uh, where we are seeing an enormous amount of change is the United States. Uh, in the United States, uh, there are complex uh, things in play uh, which have resulted in a total polarization of the American society. The people of the left don't look at the people on the right, and the people on the right pay the compliment back to the people in the left. I've lived in the United States now for nearly 50 years, and I have never seen this kind of polarization. And this polarization has led to something uh, which will have ramification for the rest of the world, that is on redefining the American state. American state is, in, is under enormous pressure from the political sides. There are those who want to limit it to just a few functions. You have a politician like Ron Paul, who thinks that the state is more of a problem than a solution. And then you have Barack Obama, who believes very strongly that without the state being actively involved, the society will become not only politically polarized, but enorm enormously polarized in an economic sense. So there is this conflict going on. Uh, it will play out over the next uh, uh, year and a half, uh, uh, or less than a year, there will be elections in the United States in November. And those elections will have tremendous amount of significance for the, for the rest of the world. Then you have the rise of China. Uh, China is a country that I studied for seven years when I was in charge of World Bank's uh, China program. That was from 1987 to 1994. And I, when I started working on China, China was a primitive place. It was, uh, uh, it was run by a bunch of engineers who had 
very little knowledge of economics. In fact, once very early on in my career, I was asked if uh, we could give uh, a lesson to the senior leaders of China on macroeconomics. So we rented a boat and we sailed down the Yangtze River from Chungchiang to Wuhan and we spent three days on the boat just to introduce to the Chinese some simple notions about macroeconomics, microeconomics, central banking, uh, fiscal discipline, provincial central relations, so on. It was that basic. And now, uh, that was 1987, 25 years later, you have Chinese economists beginning to uh, dominate the world and some of its institutions. The chief economist at the World Bank is now of Chinese origin. Then you have India, a uh, source of enormous strength in South Asia, with rates of growth of about 7 to 9% a year. But what's more encouraging about India is that it has found a way of focusing on the development of a small proportion of people in its vast population to enter uh, the service sector. Uh, and this India, this part of India has done extremely well. It has begun to dominate not only the IT industry, but a number of other uh, skill intensive industries such as communications, uh, mobile, te mobile telephones, telecommunications, health services, pharmaceuticals, and so on. So India is also uh, rising, as Barack Obama said in his uh, uh, visit to India a year or so ago, that India is not a rising nation, but India is a risen nation. And then you have my own country, and I talked about this for an hour uh, with, a, with a smaller group, uh, where there are lots of problems. Uh, these problems are the product of a number of uh, circumstances. The country's faced with a, what I call a perfect storm. Uh, how it will come out will depend to some extent on how other uh, parts of the globe uh, will deal with their problems and deal with the opportunities that they have. The point I'm making is that there is uh, an enormous amount of change taking place, not just in the Arab world, but in all parts of the world, or all major parts of the world. The unfortunate aspect of this is that each part is so focused on itself so consumed with what is happening within it that it is taking very, very little time to see how it should relate to other parts of the world. There is interest in just ourselves, our communities, and the countries in which we live. There is relatively little in how we should relate to other people in the world, what kind of associations we should build, how we should work together in order to produce a better world. And these, I believe, are going to be the major challenges for the next few years to come. Before uh, going on to make some suggestions on how uh, this, these sets of changes can be handled, let me mention to you two or three uh, changes that have begun to affect at the way policymakers uh, look at the world. The first one has happened over here in the Arab world, uh, called, I used to call it Arab Spring, but I'm told it is a sensitive uh, nomenclature. I should shift to Arab Awakening, so I'll call it Arab Awakening. Arab Awakening has done two or three things which all of you recognize and read about and discuss. One of them is that people who are affected by it, people who have brought it about, uh, 
were extremely concerned with what political scientists some 20, 30 years ago, or maybe even longer, 40 years ago, used to call relative deprivation. Uh, I had a colleague and a professor, Samuel Huntington, who won uh, fame by writing this book on the clash of civilization. But before he wrote that book, he wrote another book uh, in which he talked about uh, political order in changing societies. And he made a very interesting, and I worked with him in those days when I was at Harvard. And he and I used to talk about this. And he used Pakistan's case as one of the cases he examined. His point was that even in a rapidly growing economy, which Pakistan was in those days, growing at a rate of about 7% a year, if people are left out, they are going to question the system and they are going to ask to be rewarded by the system. And if that does not happen, and if the society is institutionally weak, these people will get up and they will ask for participation. And that's precisely what happened in a number of countries, including my own, starting in with the fall of Ayub Khan and later on with the fall of Bhutto. About the time Huntington was talking about this, another person, an economist this time, came up with the notion that there are possibly three reactions to this kind of uh, feeling of deprivation, exit, voice, and loyalty. And he wrote a book uh, on that subject. His point was that those who are deprived, those who are disgruntled, those who are unhappy with the system will make three choices. They will either raise their voice or they will continue to express their loyalty, hoping that things will change from within, or they will simply exit the system and create problems from the system from outside. The man who did this, his name was Professor Hirschman from Princeton, and wrote a very neat little book under the title of Exit, Voice, and Loyalty. This is what we have seen uh, in Arab Awakening. That particular act of self-immolation, that particular sacrifice, gave people the jolt, particularly those who felt that the system had left behind. And they then, and you know this better than I do, uh, they were prepared to go onto the streets or gather in the public squares and demand change. And they were not prepared to take anything less than change. Change happened relatively easily in Tunisia and in Egypt, somewhat more with uh, somewhat greater difficulty in, uh, in Libya. And now uh, other countries have come under pressure and one doesn't know how that is going to play about. What's happened in these countries uh, where the change has already come and is now becoming a part of the new order, what has happened in them uh, has three aspects. And these are very important in order to understand uh, the main subject of this presentation, which is Arab world in the changing economy. The first one is, that there is collapse of what I will call the grand bargain. <clears throat> there was a <coughs> there was after the exit of uh, thank you very much. There was after the exit of the colonial powers uh, from the Middle East and the discovery of large amounts of hydrocarbons in this part of the world a grand bargain, an implicit bargain. It wasn't uh, enshrined in any kind of treaty, but it was there, and people understood that it is there. It had, according to my way of looking at it, four aspects. One was expected, three of those were expectations on the part of the West, particularly the United States. This was that the flow of oil will be will not be disrupted the way it was disrupted twice in the 1970s. That oil will continue to flow at a market price and that no interference would be made in the working of the oil market. The second was that 
shipping lanes that are so critical for the movement of large ships that carry oil uh, would be protected from interference. The Suez Canal uh, and other areas around the, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, that individual countries will not make any attempt to, uh, to interfere with shipping in these. The third was that the state of Israel will not be disturbed, will not uh, be challenged in terms of its existence, and that if possible, Israel would over time become a part of uh, the newly defined Middle East, and two peace uh, agreements were signed uh, with that ended view. In return for all this, the fourth aspect was uh, that the West would tolerate authoritarian regimes to, to govern in these countries. And wink, wink, nod, nod, if these regimes happened to be very corrupt, if they were accumulating a lot of wealth, if they had a lot of riches to dispose of, these would be allowed to uh, be sent to the banks, financial institutions, real estate uh, of the developed world, and particularly Europe. There was a fifth one, uh, which I have just begun to think about, uh, so it is not fully developed in my mind as well. It was uh, uh, enormous purchases of arms by defense systems in the Middle East to keep uh, the defense industry uh, running in the West. So this was then the grand bargain, and my view is that this grand bargain is broken. And it cannot be revived in its original uh, manifestation. It will take a different form, and there will be a series of grand bargains, not just one. And it would be interesting to see how those are developed. So that's one change. The second change I want to talk about, which is happening in the, in the global economy and which has tremendous amount of significance for this part of the world, is what I describe as the demographic convulsion in much of the industrial world. You know this, I'm sure, that most countries in Europe, barring one, are either faced with declining populations or have steady populations. Populations of Italy, Spain, uh, several other countries in southern, uh, in southern Europe, in Sweden, Norway, uh, Finland, Denmark, they are declining. If you take out the little bit of immigration uh, that is coming into this country, the population of Germany is now going through zero growth. Population of Russia is declining the most rapidly. The consequence of this is that these countries are becoming, are becoming countries of aging populations. Now, my view as an economist who has a certain amount of expertise in looking at the uh, contribution human resource makes to economic development is this, that no society with an aging population can ever afford to be dynamic, can ever afford to be at the cutting edge of movement, can ever be innovative. It is the young who do this. Uh, those, my initial discipline was physics. Uh, and mathematics, and I was told that once you have crossed the age of about 25, the prospect of doing anything serious is gone. Your mind is no longer that nimble that you need to do serious, fancy mathematics. The reason I switched to economics, where in economics you can do fancy things any time in your life. <laughs> so uh, with that kind of aging population, it is difficult for Europe to stay at the cutting edge. It is also difficult for Europe to uh, remain fisc fiscally responsible because these countries, during uh, the time when their population factor was in balance, created social security systems which they cannot afford to pay now. And either they will have to cut down their social security systems or they will have uh, to bring in new people from outside. Without immigration, and when I talk about immigration to Europe, it will have to be immigration of colored people, possibly also of a religion which currently has a very bad name in Europe, Islam. Uh, unless Europe is 
to, is prepared to reconcile itself to that kind of cultural, social change, it will be weakened economically day by day. The second change that is taking place, or third if you count uh, uh, Arabian awakening is, uh, by way of the changes in the industrial production system. This is something that is not always recognized, but is a fascinating development that has occurred over the last 20 years. If you look at any major supplier of finished articles of consumption anywhere in the world, you will find that the final product was made from parts imported from all over the world. The New York Times recently did a very interesting case study of Apple, uh, the iconic uh, US company that has given us things like iPad and I, uh, iPhone, touch phone, and so on and so forth. Uh, last year, if, my, if I remember the numbers, they made about 63 million of these articles. They employ 700,000 people to make them. 650,000 of these are located in China and other countries of East Asia. Apple employs in the United States. Of these 50,000 people, about 5,000 are extremely talented engineers who develop the pro product and write the algorithms on which they are run. The rest man the, these very fancy uh, stores that Apple has all over the world. So in other words, what is happening is that the companies are producing products, selling them in their markets, but the products that are produced are not products, not produced within those countries, they're produced outside. Today, the largest component of international trade are parts and components. They are not finished products. When Boeing announced the manufacture of uh, its new uh, Dreamliner uh, 787, 60% of it is made outside the United States. A significant part of it is made in China. So <clears throat> the point I'm making is that in developing relationships, trading relationships, it would be much better if the countries begin to think in terms of becoming parts of the supply systems rather than as traders uh, that involve the exchange of oil with exchange of armaments or exchange of oil with uh, buying of radios and televisions and iPads and so on and so forth. It has to be much more sophisticated than that. The third change uh, or the fourth change uh, that is happening is in the movement of people. Uh, I've already alluded to this by way of uh, uh, explaining uh, the demographic decline of Europe. But when you look at the Middle East, you find that it is not a homogeneous uh, geographical space. It is made up essentially of two different kinds of societies and two different types of economies you have relatively small countries, small in the sense of uh, the number of people living in them, uh, but have very large exportable surpluses of carbohydrates. Then you have large countries in terms of large number of people living in them, but very little oil uh, or gas to export. In fact, most of them are importers, net importers of energy. So you have these two sets of countries in the Middle East, a large number of them uh, exchange population within them. You have Egyptians and the Palestinians working in the Gulf states because there are many more opportunities over here. But you also have people from my part of the world, India and, Ch India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, also working in the Middle East. What is happening, therefore, is that as the global economy changes, as Europe becomes restrictive about letting new people in, as Americans become somewhat queasy about importing people from outside, although their demographic situation is such 
that they will not be able to avoid it because uh, the latest report by the Department of Commerce, which is responsible for counting people in the country, is that by the year 2040, uh, more than one half of the American population will be made of non-white. In other words, the white will become a minority. And in fact, it will be a country of minorities with no majority. But coming back to the Middle East, what is going to happen is that you will need, as you change the nature of your economy and go from the production of hydrocarbons to undertaking other skill-intensive activities like running these marvelous airlines, some of them have begun, begun to dominate the world, uh, setting up new cultural institutions, setting up communication, Al Jazeera, Al Arabia, uh, developing institutions of higher learning, developing medical services, so on and so on. These will need people with very high levels of skills. You have shortage of people where these things are happening. And these people will have to be brought in from the outside. And most of the surpluses are are in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and that's where these people will have to come from. So in other words, and I will uh, conclude with that thought, I've been speaking for more than 40 minutes, I guess. I will conclude with the thought that the direction in which the Middle East has to look as the new economy shapes up is away from Europe, still a little bit uh, directed towards the United States, but considerably more directed at East Asia, which with China at its middle is going to be the largest economic center in the world by the year 2015. IMF have said that the Chinese GDP will bypass that of uh, the United States by that year. And by South Asia, led by India, which will be able to bring in new technologies, new manpower, to introduce the Middle East, which has the money, the resources, and the demand to move away from hydrocarbon and develop new sources of economic well-being and economic welfare. So we are effectively at the cusp. We are going to change. And we need to invest in understanding this change. We are very focused on what is happening in our individual countries. We need to do much more work in understanding how these six or seven areas that I have talked about, how they will interact with one, an one another and how the Middle East could become a part of this in a way that it benefits itself and benefits the areas with which it will be collaborating. Thank you very much.
have asked a very important question, I, and I had it in my note. I just ran out of time and out of my ability of my throat to sustain itself. Otherwise, I would have gotten into it. It's a very, very important issue. There are two issues that are involved in what uh, the awakening, the Arab awakening, uh, will have to do in order to make a positive progress. One is to define the role of Islam in economics. And I can talk about that too. The second is indeed the role of the military in the political system. And the countries that you have mentioned are indeed the countries where an effort is being made to establish civilian oversight over the military. Uh, the country that has succeeded the most is Turkey in this respect. The one that is Number two in this is Indonesia. Indonesia has moved away uh, from a military control to a fully democratic country. Pakistan is going through a major struggle. Uh, my own impression is that it will come out the right way. In other words, the military will have to accept uh, civilian supremacy. In Egypt, there is also a positive movement. Uh, if I read the press correctly, uh, a couple of days ago, the Muslim Brotherhood announced that it is uh, accepting the timetable uh, that the military high command had laid down for the transition. It is also accepting to work with the military as to what kind of oversight is needed in order for them to uh, come under the control of the civilians. They may not initially permit uh, total investigation of all that the military does by the parliament. They may set up a parliamentary body uh, which will then look into this matter, which is not very different from what happened in the United States. In the US Congress, there are two powerful committees. They are called Armed Services Committee, one in the Senate and the other in the House of Representatives, which are more privy to the knowledge about military than the general member of uh, these two houses. So I am very confident that we have reached a situation where for the first time in the Muslim world, uh, there will be uh, a civilian oversight, civilians being elected civilians, not civilians who've taken over through some kind of uh, guise, uh, that they will be able to bring uh, the military under gradual control. It is also interesting to go back a little into the history. Islam, after all, made no distinction between the military and the state in the early years. Uh, it, this thing lasted right up to the time of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire also constructed this military out of something called the Janissary. I mean, these people were recruited from Europe they were sometimes abducted from Europe, they were not allowed to marry, they were not allowed to hold property, so consequently they were totally beholden to the Pasha. Once that changed, they became powerful themselves. The Mamluks in Egypt uh, came from that source. Then when the colonials arrived after the collapse of the Ottomans, they didn't need the military, they had their own militaries. So, whatever military was left with was a military that was totally subservient to the colonial armies. Uh, after the departure of uh, the colonists, the military, wherever it survived, bounced back. It happened in Egypt, it happened in Syria, it happened in other places. Very interesting now is the fact that where this thing is playing out without too much bloodshed is where the military was part it was able to understand and read the writing on the wall that if it resists, there will be a lot of blood. And so they gave in quickly in both Tunisia and in Egypt. There was no military in Libya, only a bunch of, uh, what are these things called, uh, militias. And therefore it was a messy thing. And Syria is a different thing altogether. So I see military being now embedded in the new political system that are coming in. It will take time, it won't happen overnight. It will go through the kind of thing that Pakistan is going through at this point. But I think the trend is in the right direction. But while I'm at it, 
I might also talk a bit about Islam and its uh, economics. Now, uh, I have studied Pakistan very carefully for the last 50 years. And the only attempt that was made to Islamize Pakistan economy was during Kiao Bak's time. It was not a real attempt. It was uh, more of a show. It was a dress -up. You don't call it interest rate, you call it profit. And yet, the system works as it does. But what's very interesting at this point, at least from the way I look at things, is that the total failure of capitalism in the West to deliver to those who have been left behind has led to an enormous crime in the United States, in Britain, in France. There were popular uprisings in all countries, in Greece. I happen to be in Greece by chance, and that was happening, and I saw it with my own eyes, and in Spain. On the other hand, if you bring Islam in, Islam has a built-in mechanism for taking care of the poor. It has a system of zakat. If it is followed as, as it was intended, and I don't think it will be followed as it was intended, because that will kill all wealth. But nevertheless, Islam does have a way of providing of the state of the people together, depending on which figure you believe in, uh, working for the benefit of the citizens who have been left out. And that has been made very clear by the guys, a friend of mine who is the head of uh, uh, the IMF office for the Middle East, uh, was in Cairo a couple of days ago and I had dinner with him. And he was telling me that he met with the senior people of And they told him that we will only, they, they're, they're going to the fund and they want $3.2 billion because Egypt is doing very poorly. Uh, $3.2 billion and they will accept only those conditions in which the state has to function and allow to raise resources from within itself in order to give to the poor, which is what they say is one of the basic tenets of Islam. such a massive change in the systems. Uh, people who were guiding the economies are not guiding the economies anymore. Uh, there is uh, uh, rebellion on the part of the people who functioned without too much uh, questioning within a system that was basically very corrupt. And that questioning is going to lead to uh, a halt in transactions, those in which there was a large element of uh, corruption and uh, non-market payments. It always happens when these kinds of changes take place. And I am pretty confident as an economist to say to you that give this change a couple of years and these economies will bounce back. And they will bounce back in a way that there will be greater buy-in by the people who are currently out in the street or in the public square because they will see rewards for themselves in this. The taxation system, social delivery systems, the working of the government, all will improve under the pressure of the street, under the pressure of the civil society, and on the pressure of the parliaments, which have been set by these people. Is there a Pakistan awakening? And yes, there are. There is. There is a major Pakistan awakening, and it is the result of two factors. 
One is uh, that I have studied Pakistan ever since Pakistan was born. And as I said, I've written extensively on the subject. My view is that at this point, it is very poorly governed. Uh, it is governed in a way that there is really no appreciation of what needs to be done, what would be done, and what would be the benefits of doing it in a certain way. Then, uh, thanks to uh, social networks, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, uh, there is a large uh, middle class in Pakistan, which is now fully attuned with what's happening to the world, in the world outside, and particularly what's happening in the Arab world. And they are learning from that. And they have used that in order to get behind at least one person, Imran Khan, who has uh, addressed two remarkable rallies, one in Lahore, the other in Karachi, and brought out not just people but families to come and listen to him. So there is that awakening. My view is uh, that this awakening will manifest itself whenever the next elections are held, and they have to be held in the, in the next uh, 12 to 14 months, and we will see, definitely we will see a change, and I hope it will be a change for the better. I have uh, well, just more than five now. Uh, if you can be brief, uh, then I can take more questions. I'll leave them to Andrew. Yeah, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Musaddiq Malik, and I'm with Boston Innovation Partners. I, I, I talk a little, I'd like some views moved from, from economy from its traditional links, like Europe and to a certain extent the United States, and link it with other parts of the world where there are gains to be made. And I use population as a way of doing it. Essentially what I'm trying to say is that if you take a look at the way demographically the world is being restructured, you have declining populations in Europe and a more or less steady population in the United States, declining in Japan, and aging of the populations that comes with it. Their consumption pattern has changed enormously. They don't buy things that they used to buy when they were younger and growing. Old people don't need iPads and iPhones watches and things like that. They buy services. They buy healthcare. <coughs> they buy 
entertainment, tourism, and so on. And these are all labor-intensive and knowledge-intensive services. So what's going to happen is that the trade with these have to take the form of trade and services produced by highly skilled people. And that is happening to some considerable extent in the way India has carved out a role for itself in these markets. And there is no reason why the Middle East, particularly those countries that have surplus population, can't do the same. There is no reason why Pakistan could do that. Because there is no shortage of demand, it is going to explode. Uh, I see it all the time in the United States how much demand there is for services or in products that are embedded, in which uh, products, uh, services in which products are embedded. So that's where, on the other hand, you have China growing at 8%, 9%, you have India growing at 7 8%. They have need for what are usual type of things, consumer goods, toothpaste, things like that. If you remember Alan Greenspan, in a book that he wrote just after he retired, said the global product in the developed world is becoming light. And he was talking about weight. Knowledge does not have weight. Materials do. So he said that what we are producing is practically weightless. What China and India and Indonesia and Malaysia are producing are a lot of commodities. So that's where the direction of trade has to be. And that's where the employment will come from. And that's why I said, maybe I should have said with even greater force, that the linkages that the Middle East makes has to be linkages where there is growth in this kind of demand. With China, with India, with ASEAN, with Africa. Africa is now waking up. Africa is uh, now coming up. I was reading a story about this uh, development of a telescope, which is going to be the world's largest telescope. And it is likely to be based in South Africa. So things are happening around you which means that you have to move away from what is very distant in the United States to places that are closer. But before I ask the next question, I must add, uh, Dr. Burki, and to the information of our audience, that in this very room in October last year, we had a conference on precisely the subject of the Gulf and Asia. And all the papers presented at that conference are available on the WIWF website. Uh, in fact, many of those papers discussed precisely the kind of issue that you refer to about the growing linkages between the economies of Asia and the Middle East. Uh, the next question, yes, sir. Well, let me just for the sake of uh, ex-parliamentarian who economies uh, don't complain. But stick to stay in the, in the GCC or the other world. You speak very nicely about you know, indirect demand like the Tehran, the Emirates, or like New Zealand. And, uh, now, whether these things are sustainable uh, in the absence of truly working people. Now the more people leave, it's even winning for the working people, or much less for the working people. You include things like you know, transparency, accountability, and then uh, the, 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 the government in, uh, is exchanging the impact of terrain. The good thing that we're having GCC, can they be continued you know, without The question is whether it would happen or whether it can happen. I don't know whether the kind of bright spots that you see, yeah. like uh, the, the Al Jazeera or the airlines, or the, all of this can it be sustained without the market? Democracy certainly helps. Uh, you make things uh, accountable to what the people want. Uh, Al Jazeera is promoting democracy. Al Jazeera is uh, bringing voice of the people not only to the Middle East, uh, but even to the United States. I am often invited by Al Jazeera in Washington to speak at some of their sessions and so on. Uh, the interplay between uh, the type of uh, 
forces that you have talked about. And democracy, at least with my belief, is, uh, is very, very strong. And unless people find that they have been served, uh, they will not have much use for these things. Uh, I'm also impressed. I travel a lot. I, in a sense, Pakistan is virtually unconnected with, uh, uh, with the West. Uh, I travel through various uh, Gulf states. And I also use American Airlines. I am amazed at what uh, things like uh, Qatar and Emirates and uh, Gulf uh, Air and so on have been able to do. There is a combination of uh, sophisticated management, which is mostly imported from outside, and service in the cabin, which is also mostly imported from outside, but from different parts of the world. And that particular model is proving to be very successful. Uh, so since I am so wedded to democracy, and since I am an economist who has always looked at uh, uh, what contribution economics can make to the welfare of the people, uh, my view is uh, that unless by accident you acquire a very enlightened leader who has no other interests than doing well for the people, uh, lack of democracy does not work for you. The ambassador of Pakistan. Thank you for a very enlightening talk. I'm going to raise quick few of these topics. And um, to this <coughs> end, I was interested to know how you see the role of the huge pile of cash that a lot of these Arab countries are basically accumulating. It seems to me that the price of oil will continue to um, be steady. And that means for countries like Qatar, another $200 billion a year of accumulation. And there are many other countries like that. So within the context of world economy, Ambassador, that's a very interesting, very important question. It, yeah, I'm glad you asked it, because my view is that it fits in very well with the main uh, point I'm making over here. It fits in into this as follows. As you said, uh, a large number of these countries have a large number of reserves, very large reserves, and they are sitting on them. Uh, they are being invested in the treasuries of the Western world. Uh, <coughs> in fact, uh, it is possible for the United States to have a large fiscal deficit because of the money that flows in from China and Korea and Japan and the Middle East. Uh, my, my view is that if you accept my thesis, which is that the world is changing and new links need to be formed, between the Middle East, between our part of the world, 
between the Middle East and China, between Middle East and Africa, then there, this particular cash code should be put to use for making that possible. Uh, the sovereign funds, and I'm familiar with some of them, I'm familiar with the one that China is operating, have tremendous opportunity to create assets uh, in the countries where the future lies. Uh, if I am managing a Middle Eastern fund, I would look at opportunities in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so on, uh, which would do two things, which would uh, provide the kind of products that these countries need, which would also uh, create stronger links between these countries and our part of the world. At this point, there is uh, another, I, I said there are several grand bargains, and one of the grand bargains I could have talked about is a grand bargain between uh, the labor importing countries of uh, the Middle East and the labor exporting countries of South Asia. The bargain is uh, that South Asia will provide whatever manpower is needed under the condition that that manpower will not do critically irresponsible things when they come to these countries. It is implicit, it is not explicit, but it is working. So I am saying that this needs to be developed much more. Rather than bringing in very low level of skills, it might be useful to start associating very good uh, educational and training centers that have been set up all over the Middle East with those in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and so on and so forth, so that our surplus populations get very well embedded in their growing economies. And then the reverse flow comes in not only in the form of remittances, but also in the form of people who acquired some very basic knowledge <coughs> in things like education, health, entertainment, aircraft flying. India is having lots of problems these days with its uh, privatized civil aviation industry. A better association between India and the Middle East perhaps could make an input in this. Pakistan's PIA is gone. Uh, although that particular airline was responsible for setting up Emirates and so on. So there are all kinds of things can be done. Once you begin to recognize, and I, here I'm addressing the Middle that you have to reduce your dependence on the West and increase it on the East. And in increasing it on the East, come up with new ways of doing things. And these will be that we will use our enormous uh, cash balances to provide you with development. And in return, you will provide us with the kind of human resources we need. So we are running out of time, but I think Ali Bakro, uh, from Bahrain. Uh, I just wanted really to uh, put a word of precaution regarding the situation in the Arab world. I personally think that we are in the midst of a process until now, a process that we don't know where it is going exactly. And this is fair. Whether you call it Arab awakening or you call it Arab spring or you call it as Arab revolutions or Arab political turmoil, Actually, all of these apply to a certain extent to different areas of the Arab world. But the important thing about all of this is that whatever is happening in the Middle East, or in the Arab world actually, the problem is that revolutions in history, throughout history, are mostly internal. But revolutions and Arab awakening here is highly affected by so many outside factors that these may affect what will happen in the long-term future. The West has its own view of wh where this Arab awakening should go. Israel is playing a role. We have actually, the Gulf states have their own views about what will happen, what should happen in Egypt or in Syria and so on, and we are seeing this. 
Personally, I think we should not be taken much by some of the things that we see and we think they are very important. Take, for example, Al Jazeera. Yes, it is a very impressive TV station and so on. But can one be sure that Al Jazeera will be there 10 years from today or 15 years from today? Because Al Jazeera has not been created by a society. It was created by one or two or three or four individuals who happened to be there, and they believe in this. But 10 years from today, if anything can happen, Al Jazeera as an institute will collapse immediately. And this is applicable to Emirates Airline and the Qatar Airline, all of these that we are seeing uh, around us. So what I would like just to conclude with is that, personally, I think that we should be very careful about firm conclusions. We should put a lot of question marks about our conclusions, because <coughs> really, it is not going to be the next one year. It is going to be the next 10, 15, 20 years. And personally, I think this Arab revolution is going to continue for many years to come. I was impressed by what you said about political order and changing society. In reality, the problem of the Arab world was political disorder in a changing society. And this, I'm afraid, is going to be, to, to be the pivot of what's going on, what will go on for many years to come. Thank you, sir. Uh, I take your point, but your question about political order and changing societies. That was the title of the book. The title of the book uh, that was done by Samuel Huntington, who then went on to write what I consider to be an unfortunate book, The Clash of Civilization. Uh, what he was saying was that when political order is established in a way that it does not provide for all, for the entire citizenry, what happens is that it produces disorder. And then when that disorder is produced, it can reflect itself in several different ways. In giving voice, in becoming violent, in just quitting the system. That, that was his point. Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Sami Haddad, Shashir Daftar of the Manish Embassy. Uh, you spoke about uh, new directions in the Middle East uh, region, and you mentioned as well uh, the population exchange within the region. If we think about uh, the immigration from and to the region, if, uh, first, what would be the impact of uh, what's happening in the Arab world on the immigration and population movement from and to the region? And second, you please a little bit elaborate on what you think or expect uh, would be the impact of what's happening in the Arab region on the Arab uh, economy. So what was the second point? The what do you think and expect uh, the impact of what's happening in the Arab uh, country as a result on the of economy? economy on as the a result economy. of interstate migration? said that the Arab world is not a homogeneous world. It has uh, uh, countries with very large population but with very few resources. And then it has countries with uh, very small population but with huge resources. And there has been interaction uh, between these two parts. Uh, there is flow of uh, migrants from Yemen <coughs> to to Saudi Arabia, from Egypt to Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, and so on and so forth. And there has also been flow of remittances in the other direction. And so there are those kinds of linkages. Uh, what is happening to the economies, as I said in response to an earlier question, which is uh, uh, there will be disruptions. There, there already are disruptions. I saw an IMF report which says that uh, 
uh, Egyptian rate of uh, GDP increase will go down from 1.4% to only 0.2%.